Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to win money while watching college football. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with the promo code Locked On and get your first deposit doubled of up to $100. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code Locked On. Locked On Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Josh Neighbors from Locked On Big 12 joining the show today. He's going to do his weekly Big 12 roundup at the end, but I had to bring him in for the whole episode uh, to talk about the biggest game of the weekend, the Alabama Crimson Tide beating the Texas Longhorns 20 to 19. And before we get started, I just want to say a special thank you to Longhorn Nation for showing up and showing out, breaking the attendance record at DKR. I'm not sure DKR has ever been that loud. I was in the building and the atmosphere was extremely electric. I watched it again on the broadcast this morning and you could definitely feel the crowd through the screen and you could definitely tell that the crowd uh, had an impact on Bama with their 15 penalties and the offense and defense didn't look like we're used to seeing Bama play. So uh, the crowd definitely made an impact on this game. And I want to challenge the crowd to continue to do that at all home games, not just for Bama, right? Continue to make DKR a tough place for teams to come in and play. And y'all definitely showed out uh, on Saturday. So a special thank you for that. Like I said, I was in the building and even though Texas lost, that's probably the most fun I've had uh, in a long time. But now we got to talk about what actually happened on the field. And and Josh, I just want to get right into it. We're going to address the elephant in the room, no pun intended. How much, if any, impact do you think the refs had on the outcome of this game? Oh, that's the elephant in the room? I, I I didn't realize. Um... I don't think very much. I, I don't I don't think actually it was that big of an impact. I mean, Bama got penalized and there were people arguing on Twitter both ways about it. But when I watched this football game, the the officiating, except well, on for the one play where they, they tacked the targeting onto the roughing the passer, which was really bad. So was that um, a safety? I actually I did not think it was a safety. That was just me. When, after watching the replays, I thought that he still was up. And my basically my defense was well he should still be able to hit if he's he's still trying to make a play and throw the ball so I actually thought he was trying to make a play trying to throw the ball so no roughing no targeting I also you know I might have missed it totally but I watched every angle and I was talking to somebody who said oh the safety it's safety but I didn't see it that way so you know I know there's differing thoughts on that but yeah. so I I've think seen that, pictures where his shin was down like his shin right. was down before he let go of the ball so right in, they could not by, by an rule angle, though. they could by they rule that an it, it should have been a safety because his shin was down before he threw the ball yeah so if that's the case and look I think the problem was they probably had to piece the other two angles to see that and that was one issue and also I think the fact that they were trying to sort out the two penalties on top of the potential safety was what kind of you know basically the fact that we didn't get the safety call, whatever it was like, there was no look at that at all. So I, I don't, to me, the, the story should not be the officiating at all. I know it always is a fan bases. And I know probably a lot of your fans think that, but that's not the story to me. My the story to me is the, the, the Texas game plan. I think. All right. We'll, we'll get into that next, but I have to disagree uh, with my favorite lockdown host, Josh neighbors. I think it definitely had an impact on the game. I don't want to use it as an excuse or, you know, say that, Texas would have uh, of won or anything like that because you just never truly know. I mean, but when you look at it, like I said, there's plenty of, of angles that show that Bryce Young's shin, half of his leg was down before he threw the ball uh, on that play. And it was just a horribly um, officiated in the situation. Just, you know, to call that targeting in the first place and then try to say, well, maybe it was referring the passer and all of that. Yeah, that, that should have been two points for Texas. That definitely should have been a safety. Uh, the play where Keelan Robinson – Um, gets down into the red zone and they clearly rip his face mask half across his face. They don't call that. That would have gave uh, Hudson card and Texas a new set of downs and they could have possibly went up two scores and put the game away. Uh, You had the play where uh, Bryce Young. uh, Seriously. Hold on, let me finish. Hold on, let me finish. He played so long. How am I getting? How am I getting? How am I I getting interrupted on locked on Longhorns? How am I getting? How is the host host of locked on? I'm giving you, I'm, I'm giving you valid points. Hold on. Oh, your team and played then, so well. We're and then they did, they did, they did, they did, they did, they did. And we're about to talk about how well they played right, for the next all right, 15 minutes. All right, all right, go ahead. All right, exactly. And then on the play where Bryce Young, the play he's getting so much credit for, and he made an amazing play on the corner blitz from Ryan Watts, where he ducked it and, and scrambled to the 17 to ultimately put the game away. Their right tackle definitely held Ovia Gofu. And that wasn't called. So those are yeah. three crucial plays that could have changed the outcome of the game. Like I said, there's a million things that could have happened. I'm not saying that Texas would have won the game if these calls went differently. But what I'm saying is they definitely affected 
the course of the game. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. I think bad officiating needs to be acknowledged. I don't think we can just get to the, the point to where we're like, well, you know, don't use the officials as an excuse. If the officials are bad, we need to talk about it, right? Yeah, I, I, I'll leave it right there because I, I, you know, I, I know you don't agree, right? No, one more, one more <laughs> thing. It's like okay, I, okay. I, I worked the show this morning uh, for Sirius XM. A bunch of people called in, Alabama fans talking about some calls went the other way. Whether I, and I look, I've seen snapshots of them. Whether I agree or disagree with them, it's, it's besides the point. I think the problem is, especially for Alabama's way, like they played in a way that that forced them essentially in a spot where they could have been flagged much more often than they were because of how poorly they played on the whole. So. I think that point of like Alabama could have, you know, the holding every play thing, like Alabama put themselves in a bunch of really bad spots where it wasn't hard to find infractions on their side on a lot of plays. So I agree with that. All right. So last week I said my three keys to victory for this game was Quinn Ewers had to outplay Bryce Young. Uh, the wide receivers had to beat tight man coverage on the outside, specifically Xavier Worthy had to have a Bolitnikov type of performance. And Texas had to win in the trenches on both sides to win this game. I believe that Texas did win uh, on both sides of the trenches. And I believe that Quinn Ewers was on his way to outplaying Bryce Young, 9 of 12 for 134 yards before he exited the game. And Xavier Worthy was on his way to having a Blitnikov type of performance. I think he had three catches, 83 yards at the point that Quinn Ewers left the game. So what is your opinion on that? Um, do you think that um, maybe this game would have looked a lot different if, if Quinn Ewers would have stayed in the game? Oh, yeah, this game is completely different. I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you the thing about about the Alabama or the Texas game plan. Um, they did a really good job on both sides. I thought with Quinn Ewers, it was pretty clear. It was something that you and I had talked about before. Like everybody said, give B. John Robinson the ball in this game. And I get that. But to win this football game, Quinn Ewers, like you said, was going to be really good. And they were not afraid to throw the ball all over the field against Alabama. We saw plays go to the flat. We saw plays that one Xavier Worthy had into the sideline on the right side, a really nice catch, first catch he had. We saw the bomb up the middle in the seam that, you know, it was a little bit overthrown, but I thought Xavier Worthy actually should have caught that ball, to be honest, in the end zone. Like, he's an All-American player. I thought he should have. You talking about the know, one he bobbled? Yeah, that one. I yeah, think you have to catch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know it's, that's, it's not an easy play. It's not an easy one, but you got, he's got to catch that. So you think about, like, what are we talking about here? Down the middle, deep, outside in the sideline. You know, th there's, they're making you defend all parts of the field. We talked about Texas offense. That was one thing we talked about. Like, that's the big benefit. I know Bijan's amazing but this entire offense can make you defend every single part of the, of the field. Also, I think, I think Jatavian Sanders is another guy who helps out with that too. Um, so I, I like that. And also I thought they moved the running backs really around, around really well in protection, right? They made a concerted effort to get Robinson and Roshan Johnson, all those guys in the backfield moving around, get them on the edges, helping out. And uh, I think Bijan had a, I forget which quarter it was, but he had a really nice chip at one point in time. Like they, they had those guys involved and everything. And then when Quinn goes out of the game, the shots came fewer and far between. There were some more protection issues. They became a little bit, well, a little bit more. I'd say they became substantially more predictable on the offensive side of things in terms of play calling. And really what helped move the ball, Jonathan, was, was a lot of those penalties. Mm -hmm. So I know you can't treat Hudson Card the same. Look, there's a reason why Quinn Ewers won this job, right? It's when you play in Alabama and you can spread the field and go everywhere against them because of how good your quarterback's arm is and how good the receivers are as well. I know Cudson Card got banged up, man, but like that, that you were 100% right when it said change the game. What they could do became more limited when Hudson Card is in the game, in my opinion. No, I agree. And essentially, when you took Quinn Ewers out of the game, you took Xavier Worthy out of the game. Like I was at the game, and at a certain point, they didn't even roll coverage over a safety over the top on Xavier Worthy. And that's probably the craziest thing I've ever seen, but we couldn't right. take advantage of it, right? Xavier Worthy one-on-one -on -one right. with no safety help over the top. All right, Josh, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going I'm to I'm have you put this on wax right here, right now. If Quinn Ewers plays for four quarters, does Texas beat Alabama on Saturday? Uh, I, I think they've got a much – I think they cash in probably a little bit better near the, near the goal line. Now, I will say that that does change the urgency for Alabama a little bit on some of those possessions. So, I mean, I would give them a much better shot than the card. I think, I think that's fair. So – I'm not going to say out like we never know how this stuff's going to go. I'm never going to say the Heisman Trophy winner wouldn't have been able to, you know, do his thing if if pressed against it. But yeah, that task become would become a lot more harder. Now, I will say this: he probably would have made a mistake, which would have been okay. But who knows how that mistake would have been? No, I mean, look if you're if you're stretching the field against a team like Alabama, and look, 
we've seen Quinn Ewers make some mistakes. The first two throws last week were not very good. But what about but, the first 12 against Alabama? The first 12 were pretty good. That's what I'm saying. They were pretty good. But there would have been one coming at some point. So you don't know how it goes. But yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say, like, you know, it would have become a lot, it would have been a lot tougher for Alabama to win if Quinn Ewers playing quarterback. Longhorn Nation, look, <laughs> Texas was going to win that game if Quinn Ewers played all four quarters. But I guess it's, it's your job to say thing. that. It's well, your been, job <laughs> to say that. I guess we've been saying the same thing since 09, but y'all know what y'all saw uh, yeah, on no. Saturday, man. So, uh, before we, uh, you know, talk about the, the defense next and, and how great they looked against Alabama, I have to ask you, because you talked about um, when Hudson Carr got in, how the play calling, like, significantly got more conservative. It was like he was scared to let that boy throw the ball. I mean, right. it's like about third and 14, they're throwing screens and, <laughs> and throwing it to the flat. So um, how, how did you think Hudson Carr played given the circumstances? And do you think that Sark got too conservative when Hudson Carr got in the game? Yeah, it's it's a balance because you bring this guy in the game. Now, the thing is, he's played before, right? So he, st- he was the starter opening day starter last year. The options as good? No, I mean, th- they weren't. But he was opening day starter last year. I'm not a Hudson Gar- Gar- card guy. I actually don't think – I don't think he's that good. Um, he's fine. Like, as, as far as college backups go, like, he's, he's a good college backup. But, like, he's not a starting caliber player for this version of Texas, uh, at quarterback at least. So I think, I think they got too conservative. Yeah, it, it was predictable. I mean, those stretches, Jonathan, they were just moving the ball because of penalties. Did you feel like it, you know, it felt like they could move the ball easily, but it just felt like whenever they ran a play, somebody's face mask was going to get cracked. That's what it felt like to me. Yeah, yeah no, when, I mean, when they were on offense uh, with Hudson Card, I mean, you just, it's just less hope, right? And I never really felt right. like, oh, okay, they're going to be able to blow this thing open. Um, I think, you know, even when they got down, uh, to the opponent's side of the field, it's like, okay, are they going to be able to punch it in into the end zone? Are, gonna, are they going to have to settle for three? And we saw um, once Hudson Carr took over, they didn't score. Well, I mean, they scored the, the touchdown, but Quinn Ewers had gotten them down <laughs> into the red zone, and then they right. gave it to Bijan. But after that, after any drive that Hudson Card had to start, they didn't get more than three points on. And, you know, they only scored three more, uh, scored three more field goals uh, the rest of that game. And it's crazy because you go into halftime tied 10-10, and it's the – one of the biggest cliches, you know, of all time in football, which is like field goals don't win games. Scores tied 10-10 at halftime. Texas scores three times in the second half. Alabama only scores twice. But because they get a right. touchdown, they end up winning the game uh, by one point. So I did think that Sark got, you know, too conservative. I think he should have been all gas, no breaks, period, with Hudson Carr. But I think he also uh, told us without telling us how little trust he has uh, in Hudson Carr in that game and, and possibly moving forward. We'll see how long Quinn Ewers is out if he has to miss any time. A quick word from Underdog Fantasy, and then we're going to talk about the defensive performance against the Heisman winner Bryce Young and the Alabama Crimson Tide. So, once again, today's episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, and it is very easy to play. You can win cold, hard cash in a single game. And Underdog has investments from big names like Mark Cuban, Kevin Durant, who you saw on the sidelines going crazy for your Texas Longhorns, Adam Schefter, and more. They have always been focused on building superior products for a fun user experience. The customer support team is top-notch, one of the best in the business. And look, sign up with the promo code Locked On, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. Yes, deposit $100, and you will get $100 free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play Store. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code Locked On. Get in on the college football pick em action today. So, Josh, I have to say that most people did not think that this Texas team could hold Alabama to 20 points. I mean, the spread was 20 points itself. All right. So yes. how would you rate uh, Texas defensive performance against Alabama, which I think really kept them in the game uh, with, with Hudson Card at quarterback and gave them a chance to win the game, I guess, all the way down to what well, was about 20 seconds left, 10 seconds left when Alabama <laughs> kicked the game winning field goal. So I, I thought it was really funny, and I'm not sure if you noticed this in the broadcast. They kept showing Gary Patterson. I thought Pete Kwiatkowski <laughs> got compl- – I mean, just – they mentioned him, but, like, all they showed was GP when, the, when a good play happened. It's like, guys, you know he's not the defensive coordinator, right? Like, that's not actually the guy – Who's doing everything now? Well, you know, you know, you know. Everybody believes that Texas doesn't make their own decisions, so right. there might be a good fraction of people that do think he's the defensive coordinator. Well, right, but like <laughs> you're still paying a guy what two million bucks? Think Pekowski is what he makes via DC. So, but no, I, I understand. And and what has to be said about this Texas defense is that they threw every single possible look at Bryce Young. They were sending guys 
from all different kinds of angles. They'd send two on one side, two on the other side, two up the middle, one in the middle, one on the outside. Like they, their goal was to make Bryce Young uncomfortable. And look, the one thing they knew was that this offensive line had taken a lot of flack from last year. And you watch that Nash championship game again, and you see Bryce Young is running for his life. And they said, all right, let's, let's give it that. Let's give it a go. And Bryce Young, not always great in those situations. Now, look, you know, when push comes to shove, he seems to always make plays, i.e. Auburn game last year, right? I think we all watched that game and he made all the plays he had to when he needed to. This game is another good example. But it, the considering with the situation their offense was in and considering, you know, uh, the team they were playing and how bad that defense has been, they were outright bad, especially in second halves, especially in second halves. I thought their performance was phenomenal. Their game plan to start off a game on both sides was great. We talked about the offensive game plan kind of falling off. I thought their defensive game plan was consistent all the way throughout. And I I actually don't think it, it I don't think it cost them. Like that, I'm not sure who was blitzing off the edge there when Ryan Bryce Watts. yeah evaded him. Like, what are you gonna I mean, what are we gonna do there? Right? He shot out of a cannon. It's really hard for a guy to break down and make that tackle. And oh, by the way, it's a guy who's really evasive. He's the Heisman Trophy winner. Like that's a good play call. I mean, I'm not sure about you, Jonathan. Like that was no, that was an amazing play call. That was like, you the had right to do play call. You had He's to right do there. something to 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 try to. I mean, in, in that situation, to try to knock them out of field goal range, and you can't. Just it would have worked. And let Bryce Young and and, and Dyke, Yeah, it got there. It got. And yeah. That's all you can hope for when you dial up a blitz. Is it got there? And you just right, have to, right. It got there. You know, execute and get him to the ground. But it got there. It worked. The they play got call seven worked. hurries. I think seven quarterback hurries. This just shows you how good Bryce Young is. I think they had seven hurries, and I think he got sacked twice so he, yeah i just gotta get shut and he was under pressure all day um and look they made him look uncomfortable and i think that was the plan and they they executed that plan to perfection i thought so you can't be mad about a 20 point performance and longhorn nation y'all helped make bryce young uncomfortable as well josh uh yeah. i have to ask you um what did you what do you think though i don't know what do you what do you no, think no, about the defense uh, as far as the defense no, i thought the yeah. defense played amazing right like i said i was at the game and um, I thought that once Quinn Ewers went out and it turned into a, you know, a, a tough grinded out game, the defense kept them in the game. Um, you know, there was just so many. First of all, you know, I talked about the crowd with the, the false starts and stuff. I, I th thought that that hurt the offense. But outside of the one big run um, to McClellan and then, you know, Bryce Young at the end of the game, for the most part, that defense was stout and they weren't able to, right. to move the ball on them consistently. I thought that. You know, just eventually they broke down. Jameer Gibbs made some really good plays in the receiving yeah. game, and he's impossible to cover one-on-one. -on -one. Like, yeah. he just is. You know, we talk about so often, like, running backs being mismatches. That's a true mismatch. Not every running back is a mismatch in coverage against linebackers and safeties. But anytime Jameer Gibbs was one-on-one, -on -one, whether he was coming out on, like, an angle or a Texas route, anything, or, you know, that play where he would run behind the backfield and they would just throw yeah. it to him. You know, like, they they ran that all game and it was there every time, you know. So, um, so you know, good, I, I think He's that so just good. over the course of the game, you know, they were eventually to uh, – eventually able to figure out kind of that Texas defense, what they were doing, and, and make some plays off of that when it mattered. But for the most part, I think for three and a half quarters, that, that Texas defense was elite outside of, you know, one misplay uh, on an 82-yard touchdown. Yeah, and then, but, like, think about the ending number, right? It's – 20 points like sure in the end of the game they weren't great and look in a couple of years of texas is like where we think they're going and I, I know you and i seem to actually think they're going the same direction the number of people who are like i'll believe it when i see it this group is that talented they're that talented like yeah maybe you get mad in the end of the day in a couple of years when the defense doesn't hold up in the end of a close game right but that we can't be mad about that right now if you're a texas fan i know it sucks to watch but the Heisman Trophy winner beating you on that last drive, and you only give up one big play. I'm sorry. I just, I can't be mad about that. Yeah. And I could see if you had gave up a touchdown, but I mean, you have to realize how hard it is to stop the Heisman Trophy when you essentially have to stop him from getting 40 yards because right. they're already starting at the 25 and they really only need to get to what, I mean, what would you say? Probably the 35 to have a realistic chance at a field goal. So, I mean, it, it's, it's just impossible. And he can run. Like, it's just almost impossible to stop all of those weapons, stop Bryce Young. For four quarters. And his dual threat ability, right? Yeah. And you just, you know, like you said, I mean, you still only gave up 20 points. You can look at the last drive, but the total effort was elite from this Texas defense. So, mm -hmm. Josh, I have to ask you, you know, I don't feel like I, I necessarily learned. I think I mean, I think I learned. I don't think – actually, I don't think I necessarily learned anything from this Texas team. I mean, I picked them to beat Alabama, and I knew they were capable of this type of performance. I knew they were ready to play against the SEC. Right. I think all that SEC talk is overrated. I mean, yeah, if you're talking about – 
Alabama and Georgia, then maybe, but they just competed with Alabama the last time they played Georgia, they beat Georgia. And I mean, who else are they supposed to be scared of? Tennessee, Florida, Ole Miss, right. AM, who lost to Appalachian State. Right. <laughs> I mean, come on now. You know, so I don't think I learned too much about this Texas right. team that I already didn't know. But Josh, what do you uh what do you what did you learn about this Texas team? I also learned that that Quinn Ewers might be worth a couple more wins than Hudson Carr, but we'll talk about <laughs> that later in the week. So 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 Josh, what, oh my God. what did you learn about Texas? Um so I what I learned is this, is that like, so it's not lost on Sark, like what he has. I think last year, some people were like, does Sark have a grip on what is at his disposal? Right? Like, is it, or is it just another Tom Herman? We're getting talent. We can't do anything with it. I think in this game, especially when Quinn Ewers is in the game, he, he and his staff on both sides of the ball deployed their talent in the correct way. Right. I think what we can say is like this guy's never been, you know, you you can fault his play calling, right? At, at the Hudson Card stuff, but like he that's not the guy he wanted in the game. It wasn't the guy he wanted last year, it was not the guy he wanted this year. Like the Quinn Ewer stuff, it was all working, man. It was all working, and he would have had to make some more adjustments. But I think Sark showed that he has the ability to coach on the elite level as a head coach, that he showed as a coordinator. The big question for me, Jonathan, is when you play a UTSA next week, can he manage the stuff like don't let Alabama beat you twice? Can you recover from what was – that was a physical bloodbath. I mean, you saw the quarterbacks, man. Like, Card was on one leg at the end of the game. It's a violent team you're playing. So can you recover? Can you, like you talk about, motivate the fan base to come out to bring the energy in the next game? Can you make sure the team understands the task ahead, they recover, they prepare, and they don't, and they don't let one loss beat them twice? or they don't let, you know, they don't take uh, UTSA seriously enough. Like that's the stuff that is not the X's and O's that we just saw. He's really good at coaching normally. That's the stuff he has to maintain and handle that he didn't last year. And and that's going to decide how good this team is this year. Cause we know they have it in them to compete. That's a great point. You know, I've said all week and, and really for a while that Sark has proven himself as an elite OC and an, an yes. elite play caller, but the next step in Sark's journey is to prove that he can be an elite head coach. And I say to, to, you know, enter that territory, you have to do things like beat Alabama. And I think he put his team in every possible position to beat Alabama. So I definitely think uh, Sark stock went up after this weekend. But like you said, I think you that was beautiful what you just said. You cannot let Alabama beat you twice in a tough UTSA team that has played, yeah. I think, two overtime games. They in played two weeks. four overtimes total. So they, they, <laughs> they played to go in two, but yeah, they played they, Houston, they played Army on the road. So it's, it's yeah, they, they played four overtimes in, in two weeks. Yeah. So they're going to be ready to go. Uh, against Texas as well. Quick word from LinkedIn, and then we're going to get into the uh, locked on, I mean, the Big 12 roundup from our locked on Big 12 host, uh, Josh Neighbors. As you gear up for the fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Let me throw this LinkedIn uh, overlay on here before I get fired. Uh, <laughs> LinkedIn jobs help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your jobs for free. Terms and conditions apply. Once again, a lot of great jobs on LinkedIn, just not my job and not Josh Neighbors' <laughs> job. So, all right, Josh, getting into the Big 12 roundup. We know that Texas and Alabama was the talk of the weekend, but we had a future uh, Big 12 matchup in BYU and Baylor. So, what did you see in that game? Yeah, BYU gets the win uh, in overtime. A lot of college kicker action. A lot of guys missing. I mean, we saw it in the Texas game. Uh, 20 guys yards. Missing, a 20-yard field, field goal. Goals. Guys missing field goals in this game, too. This one was late at night. It was a fun game back and forth. I would, I had some concerns because BYU's two best wide receivers were out. And, Jonathan, the thing about this game that, you know, uh, Baylor's got uh, a lot of – this is actually the one way Baylor is kind of like an SEC team. They have speed. They always have a ton, ton of speed. And they got they were a lot faster than BYU was last year, and they got a little bit actually out physical. BYU did. They didn't let that happen this year. They grinded it out. They won. They were consistent. I thought in this game, um, you know, not able to score in fourth quarter, but able to score in OT. This is a fun back and forth late night game, kind of exactly the way I thought. And I think it showed that as good as we thought Baylor would be coming in, still a lot they have to work on. Man, they lost a lot at wide receiver, at running back, at a linebacker, safety, corner. I think Dave Aranda is an awesome coach. I think we all believe that. I think we all believe Blake Shapin is going to be pretty good. But it's just they're just not a top 10 team, in my opinion, at this moment in time. So fun game. And I think this was actually a really big win for BYU because if BYU loses this game, that means the last two times you played Baylor, you lost. 
and kind of checks you a little bit about what kind of team you're going to be heading into the Big 12 next year. Yeah, you talk about uh, Rockets crowd environments. I mean, you watch that yeah, that crowd in, in BYU. Literally, the camera was shaking. <laughs> I was yeah. like, like I felt like I was. I was like, man, uh, that's crazy. So last week on the the Big Twelve roundup, you talked about Kansas looking like a real FBS team uh, when they beat Tennessee Tech fifty six to ten, but they yeah. followed that up with a fifty five yeah. to forty two win over West Virginia in Morgantown. So what did you think about Kansas's performance in that game and? I mean, I hate to say this on Locked On Log Horse, but I mean, is, is Rock Kansas Chalk, man, really right? a, a team to watch out for this year? So, so you know, I, I, and I'm look. I know it's a it's a bad thing to talk about. I'm a Missouri graduate, so I'm not supposed to like Kansas at all. Um, God, I mean, this is a this this is a head coach that knows what he is doing. All right, this is not Les Miles. We got some decent players in here. Everybody's kind of running around with no direction. They're organized. They're competent. They're confident, and they're growing in strength. They have they're two and zero. Oh. They've scored over a hundred and ten points in two games. Their defense have scored. I think their special teams even scored too. Jalen Daniels threw for three touchdowns. They ran the ball uh, okay in this game for four scores in the ground. Their defense wasn't excellent, but they're a team. We saw it last year, the Texas game. Like they can score in bunches. They put up twenty one in the third in the second quarter. They put up fourteen in the third. Uh, and so, you know, they put up 13 overtime, the walk-off pick six. Like, this is just a team that has got so much more confidence in who they are as a football team. It's remarkable. They're, they've are they got 10 tries, Jonathan, to get one win. And if they get that one win, that is more than they got last year. That's also would be the over on their over-under win total in Vegas. It was two and a half. If they beat Duke in a couple weeks, hell, if they beat Houston next week, they'll, be, they'll have over on the wins in the month of September. Like, crazy. Yeah, second score in bunches. So let's hope uh, Quinn Ewers is back by the Kansas game. <laughs> All right. Uh, we don't want to put too much pressure on our defense. Yeah. All right. Anybody look underwhelming uh, in the Big 12 this week? Um, oh, I'll tell you what, Kansas State's defense looked awesome. I have to mention that. Uh, okay. Their offense okay. is 40 to 6. Um, it could have been about 60 to 6 because Missouri, Missouri turned the ball over four straight, four straight times. They threw four straight picks in their own territory, which is awful. Um, 40 to 12 is the final score, excuse me. So uh, Deuce Vaughn is still amazing. There's that. OU's first half was god-awful. They were trailing at halftime, or uh, excuse me, they were up four at halftime on Kent State, seven to three, which is weird. Oklahoma State got off to a slow start. They end up winning 34-17 over, I think it's not a very good ASU team. So there was that. Uh, Texas Tech in overtime against Houston converts a fourth and 20. I think they were, let's say, I think it was overtime. Yeah, they can convert a regulation overtime, converted the fourth and 20, and then ended up winning the football game uh, after that. So they think they converted fourth 20, got into the end zone, whatever it was. Um, but they had a massive win for Joey McGuire's group. They're 2 and 0, and they're heading to NC State next week. It's a big opportunity there. That game was a lot of fun between Houston and Texas Tech. And then this is a big one for me. This is like actually, honestly, maybe the biggest result of the entire weekend. Uh, Iowa State 10, Iowa 7. Matt Campbell has done a lot of things at Iowa State. He has not beaten Iowa. They went to Iowa City in in the worst football game I've ever watched. It, it was the actual, like, I thought Alabama, Texas was pretty bad in terms of, like, the quality of the play. Uh, I thought all the mistakes and the missing the field goals and the, some of the, you know, some, the, the being timid. Like, I thought it kind of made for a kind of a poor game until the end. This was that times a thousand. 10 to 7. There were like three red zone turnovers for Iowa State in this game too. Um, I, I just have to say, like, doesn't matter by hook or by crook. They finally got that that Hawkeye off their back, and they feel dangerous now. They're two and zero. They've got a quarterback who knows he can win on the road, even though he didn't play excellent. They've got an awesome wide receiver, Xavier Worthy. They got a playmaker on defense, Will McDonald. A bunch of guys on defense look really, really good. Xavier Worthy. Oh, Xavier Worthy. Sorry, Xavier Hutchinson. Other Xavier. Too many, too many, too many good wide receivers named Xavier. They both wear number eight, so that's that's why I got confused. Um, Xavier Hutchinson. So 10-7 win for the for the the Cyclones. Uh, finally getting that first win for them for Matt Campbell against Iowa. So yeah, kind of a roundup there. All right. So he 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 said I'm the biggest homer on the network as far as Texas, but he's the biggest homer on the network as far as the Big Twelve. I asked him was anybody yes. underwhelming this week, and he just started talking about how every Big Twelve was amazing this week. Amazing. Every Big Twelve uh, team was great. amazing this week. All right, all right. Great. That's why that's, 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 that's why we're not winning. 
but that's why yeah. I bring you on for your, your expertise. Well, you know, unfortunately, Texas didn't win either. But um, and 10 7, Iowa, Iowa State. I don't know what the over under total for that game was. 40, the was under might have been the lock of the year. Oh, yeah, it was 40. That was the lock of the year, right? Not even close. Not if, even you're close. A, if you're a gambling person. Yeah. Um, all right. So, any uh, Big 12 matchups you're looking forward to in week three? Uh, Yeah, so I I mentioned the Texas Tech game that is coming up this week. Texas Tech is going to go on the road to play uh, NC State, and that one's going to be at 7 o'clock on ESPN2. It's a really fun game. I mean, NC State, looked they've looked mortal against uh, ECU, and they they had a kick to win the game. Uh, Texas Tech has got a load load of confidence now. they got to have a lot of confidence the way they played in the first two weeks. Their quarterback looks good. Donovan Smith, man, he threw three picks yesterday in the second half and kept coming back. And that's what you need. And no Tyler Shuck right now, but that's what you need out of a guy like that. Kansas goes to Houston, which has all of a sudden become a very fascinating game. Uh, Cause Kansas is just like, they don't, they, you know, they don't care anymore. They're like, all right, we're going to wreck everybody's season. So Houston better watch out. Uh, Houston very well be Owen too. They played overtime games back to back. Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oklahoma didn't look great, obviously, but Nebraska, man, not sure if you saw what happened, Jonathan, they gave up like 600 yards <laughs> of offense to Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern threw for over 400 yards on them. Is Scott Frost. Shout out the Sun Belt. Shout out the Sun Sun Belt. Belt. Three major upsets yesterday. The Fun Belt. uh, They were, I mean, Marshall and and App State uh, and Georgia Southern, man, they're out for blood. Oh, poor, poor Aggies. Poor A&M. They lost (laughs) to Appalachian State. Yeah. But the, I, and look at this. They're 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 taking schools money and they're beating them at home. Like that they're all no made feeling. they're all made one point two million plus to, to right. beat power five opponents. Now the one thing is you think about this too, and this is a late game next week on the Longhorn Network eight, or eight later for the Big Twelve at eight o'clock Eastern, seven central. I think that UTSA Texas game is really compelling because you know that Bama like once again playing Alabama, like and I know that Texas fans know this from the first time, the 09 game at least, like they beat you up. They, they're a violent football team. And even sometimes, you know, after the play, they're too violent and stuff like that. Yeah, Dad. but yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so can Texas recover and play a team that's got to be feeling really good after they win in overtime uh, against Army? They've got some really good players in that UTSA team. So Texas needs to be as dialed in next week as they were this week to make sure they don't get upset. That game's really fascinating, too. I agree. Definitely going to be a a good game on Saturday, a tough test uh, for UTSA coming into DKR. So like I said, Longhorn Nation, let's make sure uh, that we match the energy we had against Alabama against UTSA on Saturday and make sure that this team starts off two and one going into conference play against Texas Tech. Josh Neighbors from Locked On Big 12. Make sure you're checking him out wherever you get your podcast and then Locked On Big 12 on YouTube. Subscribe and help him get to 2000 as we push forward to trying to achieve all of his goals. And of course, it's Locked On Longhorns. Jonathan Davis, your host, making sure you're subscribing to Locked On Longhorns on YouTube as well. And, you know, of course, listening wherever you get your podcast. Until tomorrow, Longhorn Nation. Peace.